so welcome everyone nice to, to see you all and uh, another event for the Scottish Geology Festival it's great to have Gary Payton joining us tonight uh, from Germany uh, but as he'll explain uh, he's originally from Edinburgh and now works uh, offshore Norway most of the time uh, so it's uh, I think a really a brilliant opportunity to think a little bit about this aspect of Scottish geology that we all we all know about we all know that there's uh, interesting stuff out there under the North Sea uh, but actually uh, in there's uh, a lot more to, to discover and Gary is going to particularly talk about uh, what his role in, in working in the North Sea has been over the last few years. So over to you, Gary. Thank you very much for coming along tonight and it's great to, great to have you. Can you hear me? Is that fine? Yep, that's absolutely grand. Yep. Can you hear me? Yep, cool. Okay, right. Okay, thank you much for inviting me tonight, uh, everybody. It's... Uh, Obviously, it's uh, a privilege to speak at the Scottish Geology Trust. I think it's an excellent idea with this festival. And I'll uh, just get started. My youngest son is just actually coming this very moment. And uh, just give me a second here. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're a little bit quieter there. Um, just so to obviously introduce myself. My name is Gary Payton. Obviously, as I said, I come from Edinburgh in Scotland. Uh, I've been resident in Germany for 20 years. I'm married with two children. Um, can everyone hear me? Hello? Yep, you're absolutely grand. Okay, basically, got my geology with paleontology, 95 to 98, and uh, 1990 2000, obtained my master's in petroleum geology. And since the last 20 odd years, basically, I've been working in oil and gas industry in a variety of jobs and positions. So I'm now actually been working the last 15 years as a well site geologist for offshore Norway uh, for a company called AGR Energy Services. Go on to the next slide. Um, uh, as I said, I work for AGR. We're basically a consultancy uh, based in Aberdeen and Savannah. We work for a variety of different customers, including the major oil companies, Acker, BP to Lundin, et cetera. We do a variety of services from geophysical interpretation to uh, geology and engineering, drilling, et cetera. Um, yeah, so I'll basically break this talk down to six parts effectively, you can see them here, the offshore environment, the geology of the North Sea, drilling a well. But I'm gonna give you a basically a simple guide to the offshore environment, just to put you in the place where I actually work. A very simple summary of the geology. Uh, what is required drilling a well? What do you do when you go up sort of, you're a geologist, a well site geologist? And I'll briefly discuss the future of the oil and gas industry as we see at the moment. And I will conclude this talk with the environmental implications of this uh, actual industry. The offshore environment. Okay, people, just to let you a quick guide. As I said, I work offshore Norway. Uh, there's three principally, principally three large areas to offshore Norway. We have the Barents Sea to the north. And then we have this area called the Norwegian Sea. And then we have the so-called Norwegian North Sea. I've worked in various blocks or quadrants. If you look here, you can see these quadrants, basically. And the quadrants are subdivided into particular blocks. And each of these blocks are given out to particular companies to drill on. They have particular licenses. So as a well-site geologist, my company obviously has a contract with a particular company. And I, therefore, I'm sent to particular areas. I've been up here on the Russian border, actually, it's called Stanglistead, and I've worked in various positions, locations down here, and uh, the more frequent currents of oil fields down here. So basically, I'm a connoisseur of the region shelf, so to speak. I've covered quite a distance in my last 15 years. Okay, the joys of travel. People say, well, how'd you get to the Garing Road? Basically, I get offshore by helicopter. And it's a very simple process in Stavania, Bergen, or elsewhere. You have the, in Norway, the helicopter terminal, and it's like a large airport. And uh, 
basically you check in, you get your SMS message. It's all done online. And there's the details here, for example, helicopter BHL 462, departure at 1500 hours. And it's going to a red call immersive interceptor. Okay. Uh, usually the journey takes about an hour to half an hour. And during that journey, you're given a very attractive one piece fetching orange suit. Can everybody hear me? We're okay. Hello? Yeah, you're, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely fine. No worries. I'll give you a shout okay. if there's any problems, but yeah, you're doing okay. Yeah. So Okay, so therefore we actually fly to a particular location using this type of helicopter. This is the Koski S92. It can carry 22 people. It's quite a formidable machine, actually. It's got a lot of backup systems. Uh, it can actually, it's got two engines. It can fly in one engine. Uh, they're extremely expensive aircraft. Uh, the previous Pumas have basically been removed. Uh, people were just not feeling comfortable with them. Too many accidents where you have now this uh, particular machine. And as I said, you basically sit in your helicopter about an hour's journey and you go to these particular areas, locations. As I said, you've got your quadrant with particular blocks, the particular oil fields, for example, the Edward Gregg there, uh, the Brynhild, the Tambor. These are all names that I recognize and that I visited and I worked on the last 15 years. You can actually see the concentration of particular oil and gas fields here. Uh, it's quite a prolific area, actually, a very busy area indeed. And these helicopters are back and forth like taxis the entire day, Monday to Sunday. People say, what's it? You have a busy two weeks on the platform, Gary. Well, I don't work on platforms. Platforms are actually large production units. OK, they're sitting there and they are producing oil from a particular oil field. I work in the drilling, to which Usually, I work on a semi-submersible or a jack-up rig. A jack-up rig is basically used for water, shallower water conditions. It's got these legs that can drop down to the seabed up to 500 feet. The semi-submersible is basically floats. It's held in the position by various anchor chains, and it has a propeller system. Even deeper water conditions, actually, you could have to use a drill ship. But these are the two main rigs I'm using as sort of it associated with the semi submersible or the jackup rig. I have worked in land rigs in previous jobs. I've actually worked in Canada, Alberta, uh, worked in Uganda, but these are the two main rigs that I usually travel to. And people say, well, what's it like working offshore, Gary? Well, I've got to say, people, working offshore in Norway is a very comfortable living environment. I think the food is fantastic. This is the exception. This is the 17th of May. This is Norwegian Constitution Day. They celebrate their independence from Sweden. But the food is a very high standard. You basically share a cabin with uh, your colleague who's on the alternative shift. Uh, you have a lovely view from your bedroom or office window. And uh, you have a gym if you feel that type of way. Or you can basically go to a games room, uh, watch a movie in the cinema, etc. And the working environment is actually very, very thorough and professional. Safety is always the number one criteria. And you learn basically to work in a team. You can see here, these guys are collecting around this thing. This is a 36 inch fit. This is a guy that actually hits the seabed, what we call spudding a well. And that's the initial top of the well. Uh, people say, well, well, people think actually there's a very simple process where an old company just takes a rig and drills a well. No, it's a very complicated process. It involves several companies. You have the particular operator. For example, let's take, in this case, Acker BP. The Acker BP basically wants to drill a well and forms a partnership with an additional company, Lundin. These guys then go to the drilling company. In this case, Merce Drilling. Merce says, yes, we've got a rig available. Okay, now to drill a well, you need a lot of other accessory companies. They all do different things as well. For example, Schlumberger might be doing various engineering, drill equip the subsea, Frank's the casing, drilling mod is done by Swaco, and Halliburton might do another type of work. But you can see it's basically involves a lot of different companies and a lot of different people. Now, how much does a well cost? Well, let's just say it's a very expensive thing. Depending on the type of well, there's production wells, there's exploration wells, et cetera, location. But this is a set example. This is about five years old. A friend of mine sent me this. 
And just to put some numbers in perspective, this swell was planned to last approximately 107 days. You can see the various uh, uh, what's required, the type of what was required during the process of drilling the well. And it's accumulated cost of approximately 588 million NOC, which at today's exchange rate works out as 47 million pounds over 107 days as a budget. That basically breaks down to 440,000 pounds a day to drill a well. Indeed, time is money. If there are delays, and it goes into several days over budget, and a week and two weeks, people start to get really frustrated. It's costing a lot of money, like £440,000 a day. And that was five years ago. Obviously, it's a lot more expensive now. Let's go into a summary of the geology of the North Sea. Okay, and I apologize, I might be patronizing some people. I'm not really, I don't really know much about the level of people here. Some may be actually professional geologists and maybe so might be actually completely new to particular stratigraphy. But to summarize in a broad sense, what you have in the North Sea is a large rifting process. It's basically from the middle to the late Jurassic, you have a rifting, so similar to what you see in East Africa today. You have this Y-shaped structure. To the north, you have the Viking grabbing. So you, have, you have to the west the Maury Firth graben, and then you have the central graben. Here, obviously, summarized in this particular map. Now, this rifting process did not continue indefinitely. As you see, for example, as we know from our plate tectonics, you have the introduction of basalts, the formation of a small ocean. It failed, what we call nullicature. But the main point, the main point I want to emphasize here, that this, in effect, has formed a significant sedimentary basin. And with that, particular formations have been dropped down along the series of normal faults. You see this small schematic picture up here of the horse and grabbing structure. And the point, important point is that some of these particular formations are organic rich. Okay, they've been dropped down where the geothermal gradient is significantly higher. You can see in this picture here, two pictures actually, you see these cross sections going across the North Sea. You have this, what's been picked out interpreted in the seismic, this rift basin, the basement itself, and the various intervals, the Jurassic, going up through the Mesozoic, and the thin layer of quaternary above. Okay, you see that obviously the sea is normal faults, and all these particular formations have been dropped down further. Now, what can we say about the of the North Sea? We, it's probably one of the most explored, drilled areas in the world. And to that sense, we have a very integrated, intensive coverage of the stratigraphy. This is an area from the central North Sea up towards the South Viking Grab, up towards the Norwegian sector of the Norwegian Sea itself. This is actually can be used as an app on their iPhone, their iPhone. It's, uh, I've drilled through these particular formations so many times. Now you'll see here lots missing, the various gaps, for example, here to Lord Jurassic, up to the Upper Jurassic, and various areas. Okay, that indicates an unconformity. During that rifting process, you have updoming of the crust and subsequent erosion before the rifting process continues further. And so therefore, a lot of the Lord Jurassic to Middle Jurassic intervals are missing. So in some places, for example, you can go from Upper Cretaceous straight down to Late Jurassic. And the significant unconformities up here in the Miocene to Pliocene as well. It's all a matter of science, people. And that's one of the most fascinating aspects when you drill a well that really gets people interested. When you drill a well, for example, whatever depth you can get to. You start up here, as I showed you in the previous picture, the 36 inch bit that drops into the seabed and makes an initial hole at the top. You're drilling into recent and Pleistocene sediments. 
some things that can be problematic as you come across these huge big boulders which have been left there as the ice sheets have come and go, come back and forth across the North Sea area in various uh, advances and retreats. And depending on your rate of drilling, and one day shift a night shift, you can drill up from here from the Miocene and actually get work your way down into, for example, the Paleocene, cross the mass extinction event into the Light Cretaceous in one shift. So basically, you can say to people, well, I've had a busy shift, I've just drilled 75 million years of history. Okay. That's, and that's quite a sobering thought. And what's the fascinating aspect? As you drill through these intervals, obviously there are different sedimentary rocks which reflect the different depositional environments in time, uh, to which point you can see a small red star put there next to the Oscar formation, which is late Cretaceous in age. And there we can see a, a summary, a sort of map of the late Cretaceous about 70 million years ago, sort of showing the indicating the difficult depositional environments in here. So effectively, a well was here. At that time, late Cretaceous, you had a shallow cell sea, basically, hence the deposition of carbonates. Now, one picture of space of thousand words, and I think we seem to forget that as we're on a regular looking across the North Sea. This is what we drill. We drill through these huge intervals of rock, Largely, they're obviously expanding in thickness or decreasing in thickness, turning into siltstones and mudstones as we go further in a certain direction. So what we do, we drill a well, could be a, a diameter, for example, eight and a half inch inches, and we put it through here. Now those formations have got to be interpreted as we're drilling. This is what exactly what we have under the North Sea, ladies and gentlemen. This could be a reservoir, for example. This could be a whatever we see, drilling. And then we put another well over here, and one behind there, and we extrapolate and join these wells up. So this is the kind of picture you've got to have in your head when you're drilling a well. And it's a picture that sometimes people forget. And to that point, for example, we can start to correlate the data from many wells across, from the UK side, the Norwegian side of the North Sea. Now, these red and black lines are basically data which we have collected. We have recorded this data from drilling a well. The gamma ray resistivity measurements made for the rocks as we drill. And you can see the particular features that have been cross correlated. And to that mind, you can start to build up a broader sequence stratigraphic interpretation on lap. Uh, system tracks, transgression, flooding surfaces, all that type of thing. As I said, people, this is uh, this is unique. North Sea is a very phenomenal area because we have such a high density and concentration of data available to us. How many wells have been drilled in the North Sea? Well, a lot, believe me, thousands. This is basically a what I've done, I've done a screen grab of a particular application we use at work. This is a small area. And you can see, for example, this field down here, Johan Verdrop, the saturation of wells that have been drilled. This is a field, and therefore there's a lot of wells being drilled. You can see other wells being drilled out here, there, one up here, exploration wells. Mm -mm, they're pretty, like a little empty hole there. Nothing was found there. And this is a small area. And this is not all the wells in just one particular area. You can see these lines indicating the normal faulting. How many wells in the Norwegian shaft, for example? Did, did more than 5,000 wells have been drilled in the Norwegian shaft since 1963 or whatever. Well, 63% actually, not the North Sea itself. Uh, 819 in the Norwegian area and 158 in the Barents so that's 5,000 wells. That is a phenomenal amount of work. And the UK, I believe, on the UK continental shelf up to this moment, is approximately 7,800 wells have been drilled. Okay. So this is quite a surprise to a lot of people. A lot of people think there's only about 50 to 100 wells being drilled or whatever. Now, it's a very prolific industry. And I think the point is about the oil and gas industry is offshore, it's out of sight. 
It's not been jolted on land. It's been jolted far away from people. And it's a very big industry. Now, what happens when you drill a well, when you find a field? Well, and if it's producible, uh, then we basically install a large platform device. Obviously, the oil company said it's worth the investment of several billions worth. So a particular platform is installed and you have a myriad, huge number of wells, up to 60 wells it can be, producing and also injecting. Put this into scale, for example, if we were to put our platform in London area and position it around Leicester Square somewhere, you can see how far some of these wells extend for several kilometers in various directions. As I said, you have these production wells. And as you produce oil and gas from your reservoir, you lose the pressure. The pressure drives production. So you've got to replace that pressure in a particular reservoir uh, unit interval. So you pump down either water or gas. And that's what you can see in these various other levels. But you can drill up to 60 wells on a platform. Depends on the number of slots. The platform sits on a template below the sea. Some are built with 20 slots. Some are built with 60 slots. Once you use all your slots up, well, that's tough. What are you going to do then? You have to build another template, for example, and more infrastructure. Okay. Now, this is a short screen grab just to emphasize the number of wells that get drilled. This is basically where I was last at a few weeks ago, near the Alvine field for Acker BP. Uh, you can see the tangle of number of wells which are going down from various production units and platforms going down to the reservoir interval. As I said, some are producing and some are pumping down water to maintain the pressure within the required reservoir. This is a 3D application that we use. We can zoom in, we can pick up particular details in various wells. And it's very effective because you see this in this image view and you can rotate around 360 degrees, etc. It's a fantastic application to use. Now, any petroleum geologist knows this off by heart and like to go through this. It's called the play. The play is the fortuitous series of events and circumstances that leads a sedimentary basin in a particular area to become a hydrocarbon producing area. Okay, this is emphasized, summarized in this one picture here, where you have a source rock, which is an organic rich shale, for example, the Kimmeridge formation. The generation, as I mentioned before, the the source rock going down to a particular interval where temperatures are high enough to start processing and cooking that organic material into something called kerogen. And then you have to have a migration route. So very well, this oil and gas starting to, to be produced from this particular shale interval. It's got to go somewhere. It goes up through faulting, it goes up through fracturing. And then it's got to find somewhere to be accommodated in effect. It's got to find a reservoir interval with particular porosity and permeability, and it's got to stay there. It's got to be trapped. You want to have an effective seal, either another mudstone interval or shale, or even an evaporite salt, for example, which is completely impermeable. Let's start at the first point. As I said, the source rock. Now, if anybody's been down to Kimmeridge Bay in the Dorset coast, you would have definitely visited the Kimmeridge. It's a fantastic place to go. You're not supposed to go back in the cliffs for fossils, but uh, if nobody's looking, hey. Um, and it's organic rich. If you try hard enough, you can set fire to this stuff. It's absolutely bituminous. It's full of oil. It's still a, I think it's still a northern donkey. There was when I was a student. That produces X number of barrels per day. And it's a, a source rock. And this is basically what you have in the North Sea. This is a major source rock for the North Sea. Okay. And it's called drop. Now, this is a typical thing about uh, Norwegian stratigraphy and British stratigraphy. It's effectively the same formation interval, but it's across a, a border. So the hemorrhage is called the drop now, but it extends across the entire area, central North Sea. What sometimes called a mandal, across the South Viking Graben, etc. 
and it's uh, late Jurassic in age. And basically these brine, the Sleipner, the Ness, these are all reservoir intervals. These are all good producing sandstones. Now here's a question for you, it's below our drop now, how does that happen? It's still not actually understood. We do have reservoirs which are actually below the source rocks themselves. And it's happened. How do we get the generation of hydrocarbons? Right. Let's start at the very beginning. Effectively, we have deposition of uh, a very poorly mixed water column. In the stagnant sea, you have anaerobic conditions in the sea bottom. You have the deposition of organic material and plankton, phytoplankton, other organic debris. And as I said, you have an anaerobic condition, so the breakdown of organic material is very slow or negligible. And that's deposited with clay. And through overburden and further deposition, you have an increase in pressure conditions. And if the plate tectonics allow it, rifting process, downfaulting, that particular source rock, that a large amount of organic material with the clay gets down to a create a temperature to the point where it even starts to break down organic material into kerogen, then it happens, and you have the, the creation of oil and gas. That all requires a significant period of time. The migration, as I said, you've got the source rock down here, and it's reached a particular depth, what we call the kitchen, the geothermal gradient is high enough, and it's migrated upwards, and it's found a place where it's trapped, basically, and it's reservable. It cannot go any further. You have a permeable cap rock. Now, what makes a good reservoir rock? Well, basically, let's be very simple about it. A rock which is a space net, a sandstone, for example. People find it very hard to believe. If you take a piece of sandstone, take a thin section through it, sandstone is obviously through diagenesis, diagenesis has been cemented, all these quartz grains, but there's still a certain amount of porosity and connectivity between the porosity, between the pores, co-permeability. And you get up to 10% actually volume space within a sandstone. You can see here it's indicated by blue staining here. This is a little cartoon to explain that basically you have these quartz grains, you have a set negligible water maybe, depending. That's a factor you have to take into consideration regarding producing oil you have the oil and gas trapped in between the grains itself. And there's a lot of factors that lead to a good quality or bad quality reservoir rock, sorting, for example, or how much cementation is in the quartz grains. You might have carbonate cementation to a certain extent. You might have silica cementation. You might have the currents of its clay minerals, which are derivatives of feldspar, such as illite, kaolinite. There's a lot of factors going into making a good reservoir rock or a very poor reservoir rock. And to emphasize that, here's a selection of various pictures and various reservoir intervals. And you can see the difference, just as you instantly look at it, you can see the blue space here. And you can see some are very good. Uh, T formation was absolutely excellent. The Cook formation and the Rannick formation. There's a lot of classic material in between there, which is basically really reducing your, your uh, permeability there. So you can see the, the various differences in reservoir rock types. And that's basically, here's a typical reservoir. This is a Brent sandstone. Okay, and this is a water weight. This is further up in the column of the reservoir itself. Obviously, no, sorry, lower down. Obviously, water is more dense than oil. It's going to accumulate in the bottom part of the reservoir. And if you take your your oil column from the reservoir rock, you have this particular lovely brown color, this oil stained effect. And uh, this is uh, a reservoir interval, but to cord about two, three years ago for a particular oil company. Now, it's not complicated. You take the cap off the end of the cord barrel and it's a sandstone. And you can see the great, the fantastic cross of permeability there. And it's absolutely dripping with oil. There you go and it smells just like the garage at home. Now, as I said before, it's got to be trapped here. It can't go any further. You need a cap rock to stop it to escape into the surface. Okay, you need a completely impermeable interval provided by a sandstone 
or in some cases are assault. Okay, and if you see these uh, block model diagrams, you see here the source rock, your B, which is the reservoir rock, and you see the various circumstances. Okay, for example, the oil is migrated upwards and this anticlimax structure is trapped there by this ceiling rock, a permeable shale, or it can migrate on fault lines, again, be trapped. Salt makes a very effective trap, but it's a terrible stuff to drill. It's extremely dangerous, actually. These are all various circumstances. These are, this is something which has become very, it attracted a lot of focus in the last 15 years, stratigraphic traps where you have on lap, basically, of more coarser classic sediments and uh, well, then further onlapping and flooding surfaces, which also create particular traps. So you can see there's certain different circumstances. No two trap mechanisms are exactly the same, but the principles are there. You need a source rock, you need a migration route, you need a reservoir rock, you need a seal. Okay, and all these factors come together, you have a play, and that's what's happened in the North Sea and also to a certain extent in the Norwegian Sea and the Barnes Sea. Let's take a drink of water. Process of drilling. Right, this is going to be very basically summarized. I can assure you the drilling process can be quite complicated if you go into detail. So this will be the basics, so to speak. Now let's start at the very bottom when you're drilling. What do you need to drill with? You need a drill bit. It's as simple as that, okay? Drill bits come in different shapes and sizes. Okay, these are the ones that come in and we use towards the surface, softer sediments. You have this milk tooth bit or the insert bits. This is what people always imagine what a drill bit to look like. But mostly nowadays, once we get down to deeper depths and much harder, firmer formations, we use this thing called uh, PDC or the polycrystalline diamond compact drill bits. Okay, you can see these teeth along the edge. These are called the cutters. Okay, and a drill bit is quite a complicated piece of equipment, actually. They have these, what we call these blades with the side cutter teeth, which are industrial diamonds, impregnating tungsten. And you have these gaps in between these blades to allow the flow of mud. Yes, we drill, basically, yes, we, we drill with the mud. We, and they come out these nozzles here. Okay, you see one, two, three, you can different sizes of nozzles. And this rotates in this direction, it's always anti clockwise. It rotates about for anything from 120 to 150 rotations per minute. Okay, if you want to buy one of these things, they'll cost you anything, anything from 30,000 up to $80,000. Okay, and it could be utterly destroyed in two days of drilling. There you go. Uh, you can replace to a certain extent parts of the drill, but you can reuse them, but um, they are used and abused things. Okay, that's the that's what we use to effectively drill with most of the PDCs. Now, here's a complicated picture. This is called the BHA. Behind your drill bit, which is down here, okay, you have a series of electronic devices. This is called the BHA. These are all sensor devices. These are going to take various measurements of your rocks as you are drilling, okay? Uh, these all get screwed together on the drill floor. They come in components. Okay, you various names. They do various things in measure resistivity, they measure gamma rate, etc. I'll come into detail later on and talk what the actually each particular measurement is. The drill floor. So we picked up a drill bit, we connected the DHA, and we connected the drill string. And that passes through the drill floor. Okay, this BHA as I said, connects onto particular types of tubing, metal tubes called stands. Each one is approximately 30 meters long. They are lined up in a systematic way, each with particular numbers, okay? And as you drill down through your rock, this disappears further through the rotary table, etc. You pick up another stand, another 30 meters, and you continue drilling, yeah? Nowadays, this is all done by machinery. Nobody comes in contact with actual the drill sting itself. This thing is called an iron roughneck. Okay, you saw really bad accidents before. People wrapping, using tongs or chains or whatever. It's all done by automatic machinery nowadays. 
things have moved on tremendously. You see this chap sitting in here. He's basically, this is like a control room. This is called the doghouse. And uh, these guys control the manipulation of the equipment. It's a very intense, very concentrated work. You do not go in and ask silly questions when these guys are working. And uh, yeah, but it's still, it's, uh, as I said, it's very intensive work. And as a geologist, obviously, you're required to inform the drill of information so you're drilling, etc. Always communication is always the best thing. But you speak to assistant driller, you know, you don't speak to the guy who's busy in the chair at the moment. It's almost like a cockpit. It's got various joysticks to, to control the various pieces of machinery. Now, as I said before, we drill with the mud. Okay, you can, this, uh, we, as we're drilling, the drilling process creates a lot of rock debris. It's got to be circulated out that hole. Okay, and we have a particular circuit, a system of drilling mud. If I come to this picture here, just to simplify what this picture is showing you. The mud stacks are here at the, okay, let's start the mud pump, goes up to the derrick, comes through that top drive, which is here. In this case, the top drive is connected to a particular standpipe. The mud flows down the inside of the drill pipe like a straw is pumped, maybe it's something like 2,000 litres a minute, for example, continues down, comes out those three holes at the bottom of your drill bit that I showed you before, picks up the rock debris, comes up the outside of the drill pipe, there's an interval called the annulus, returns to the surface, passes by the shale shakers, which is like these huge sieve machines that clean out the rock cuttings from the mud, back to a suction tank, mud pump, clean mud, back down the hole again. So in effect, we have one complete circuit, non-stop oil drilling. We need that mud. Basically the mud is there to, as I said before, clean out the rock debris. It's also got to keep the drill bit cool and it's a hydrostatic overbalance mechanism as well, which I'll come to later. So we drill the well, we drill to a particular depth section, we pull out a hole, we run casing down, okay, because we have to stabilize that, our borehole, which has been freshly drilled, and we cement that casing. This is our casing here, for example, you have a collar here, you have two plugs. The bottom plug's got a thin perforation hole in here. So you drop your bottom plug, you're pumping X cubic meters of cement. You drop your top plug. You pump mud behind that, and the two come together and meet like a syringe effect. The, mud, the cement passes through the bottom plug and squirts out the bottom of your casing, comes up the outside of your casing into annulus. Hey, guess what? You've cemented your casing. You can continue drilling the next section. So as the well progresses in depth, the diameter decreases. You can see like this Constantina or telescope effect where you're starting with huge, large casings of 30 degree, 30 inch diameters. And your last case, the production liner, could be only six inches. Okay. This is what casing looks like as it comes from the factory. And this is what's in place within your open, freshly drilled porthole. The BOP, it's absolutely essential, it's vital, it's a, the effective safety mechanism against blowouts. Okay, you're working with phenomenal pressures down there. The average pressure of formations in the North Sea is anything from 350 to 450 bar pressure. Your car tire is 2.5 bar pressure, just to have some sort of scale in your head, what kind of pressures we're dealing with, okay? If we take something called a kick, fluid, oil, gas, water, and 450 bar, for some reason or other, it's coming to the surface, this BOP is utilized. It has a primary and backup systems, okay? You see these things called shear rams. They can close the well in a matter of seconds. If this drill pipe, which obviously needs to pass through the BOP into the well, if the drill pipe is there, it will shear this drill pipe like a piece of spaghetti, no problem. These things are tested every two weeks. It is mandatory, it is a law. 
either has to work with primary and backup systems. There you can see a sort of clearer picture here of what's called a pipe ramps. They can actually close around the pipe itself. If the stove is a problem, they still have pressure coming to the surface, then these guys get utilized, okay? Right, uh, working as a well site geologist, what is my participation in this process of shore of drilling? As I said, we have a series of casings. We've drilled various sections, okay? And we have cased off each section. As a Pleistocene, you have a burden, basically, and we worked our way down to the reservoir interval, okay? Now, this is a vertical well, a schematic picture. So I can assure you most wells nowadays are not vertical. They deviate. They deviate to the point that they can now drill 90 degrees horizontal. My job principally as a well site geologist is to pick these particular formations out when they come in and to say, that's it, stop drilling. That's as far as we're going. This is the depth we are setting the casing. Okay, that's principally my job in a very short, summary sentence. Well, first of all, when people say, well, how on earth do you know where to drill? Where, where you, you, know, you put a rig in a particular location, why do you, how do you work it out? You know, is it luck? No, we don't. First, basically, first of all, we obtain this geophysical data. Okay, and you see a series of lines going across there. They might seem so confusing. What they are, they're reflections from different intervals. Okay, the reflection are from seismic waves. The seismic waves, seismic waves reflect or bounce off its intervals depending on the velocity, the density of the particular interval. A contrast in density and velocity through particular intervals will give you a good reflection, as we picked out here. There's a color coding where you have the negative and positive polarities of the reflection, painted black or blue and red, so you can pick them out. If there's no contrast in velocity, density, between formations, you get a very poor reflection here. That's it. And once you start getting your eye, you start picking up particular features. There we go. See that on laugh there? Okay, could this be an unconformity? Very disruptive layer here, a lot of faulting that's going on here. And so therefore you make a broad interpretation, okay, in two-way time. This is not actual depth, this is two-way time. So you do have a lot of artifacts. And the interpretation can be wrong, especially with respect to exploration drilling. If you have 25 wells within 20 kilometers, you can have a bit more precision to your interpretation. Okay. And sometimes the geophysical interpretations are extremely good. As I said, depending on the number of wells you have that have been drilled, you can apply your data to your science sections and you can see with a particular formations that we picked out here. For example, one called the Johansson formation. You can see where faulting has been picked out, for example. So basically you take your science of the section and you can have a broad interpretation of a stratigraphy as you're drilling a well. This is a well with a high inclination. And uh, we have a, what's called a prognose depth. Now you, there's two depths that we use as a well site geology. So we use measure depth, for example, along the length of the well, and we use TBD, okay, which is obviously going to be shorter. Okay, so you've got this broad interpretation. I've got this picture to use, but as I said, this picture can be wrong. That's why I'm offshore. Yeah. Now, first of all, the first piece of information that we get is a cuttings analysis. Okay, this looks like a forage machine. Okay, lots of mushy stuff. This is your rock cuttings coated in drilling fluid. You take this stuff away and you clean it. And you have your sample from particular depths. See, there's 2890, 2900, 2910. Oh, this is changing here. We've got a different type of mudstone, different color, different properties. That's it. That's the base of what we could say, for example, for the Horgland group and the top of the Rogland group. There we go. I picked out a formation top just from these cutting samples themselves. And they're analyzed basically by using a, a simple microscope. You use HCL for detection of carbonate content, et cetera. You have a UV box there as well. This is the laboratory that you have offshore, the mud loggers lab, as it's called, a color chart, because we all use this chart because some of us are colorblind, believe it or not. Somebody's greenish blue is different from somebody else's medium gray, for example. Yeah. 
And it's essentially, it's nuts and bolts, basic undergraduate geology. It is sedimentary petrology, okay, to tell what type of sediment rock have you got. If you've got a classic rock, have you got a carbonate, for example, there's some bits of mineralogy, presence of microfossils. And sometimes it's a very easy job to do, and sometimes it's a very difficult job to do. Remember, remember that uh, drill bit is absolutely destroying your formation with 10 tons weight on the bit and it's rotating at 150 RPM and your sandstone comes up as loose grains sometimes. This is what happens when we take formation that's been drilled, okay, the reservoir with a water-based mud and we apply a chemical to it, a solvent, put in our UV. This is called a shoal. This, without a doubt, is a simple evidence to show that there are hydrocarbons within the cuttings. Okay, that's only water-based mud. If you use oil-based mud, it's going to fluoresce anyway. So, as I said, it's just basic undergraduate geology: sorting, grain size, sphericity, etc. You... Yes, LWD. As we drill, we take a series of measurements for the drilling. Okay, this is really fancy technology, people. Okay. We drill, we can measure the rock at the same time. We have a series of sensors I've described before as a pulsar. It sends out micro pulses in the mud. It's picked up by a pressure sensor. Okay, it's binary, ones and zeros, zero ones and ones and zero, which is obviously translated into data that I can use. And this is the data I see on my computer screen. We pick up these particular measurements, the gamma ray, resistivity, neutron porosity, fault density, if I, for example, here's a simple example. Here's a gamma ray. That's for shale, high gamma ray, cleans up into sand, increases again. Resistivity measures the gas and liquid content in the formation because rock, carbonates, and plastic material are absolute perfect insulators. Okay. So this is what I get. That's what I'm looking at in real time, all these measurements. And my job is to instantly look at there and uh, translate that into what, what particular rock it is in combination with my cuttings. And you can start to pick up particular features in the gamma ray as well as you're drilling. Yeah, you can see the various uh, features in the gamma ray, the channel point bars, etc., etc. And this is a typical work desk. Okay, you're looking at your logs up here. You got your camera on the, the shaker, so just to keep an eye. You've got your drilling data here. There's a bit depth. We are drilling at 4,908 meters. Okay, that's measured depth. The TVD is 2,900 meters, almost three kilometers vertical depth. And all the various other numbers are coming in. And at the same time, you're trying to keep up with your geological interpretation as they're drilling at 120 meters an hour. I, I believe it, people, it can be very, very fast, hectic work. Some things, the formations are very simple. You can see it's green. Thick mudstone intervals, thin limestones going through. Hey, been here before, you know. Other times, I am really struggling here, and people are asking you questions all the time. It can be very stressful work. And this is what I look at. Glance at the screen. There we go. Measure depth, TBD. Okay, we're drilling at 27 meters an hour. With, with the mud flowing in at just over 2,000 liters a minute, and the gas is 50 to 30, 0 0.18. So this is all this data I can see on my screen all the time. Uh, one thing about being a, a well site geologist is that you have to look for any indications of overbalance. Overbalance is a dangerous situation to be in. Your mud exerts a hydrostatic pressure, for example, 450 bar. Okay, your formation will be 400 bar. You want to have, for example, something like 50 bar overbalance. That's good. Stops fluids a gas coming into the well bore, okay? If the reverse, you have underbalance, okay? Gas, oil, water can come into the well bore and you have a kick. That's a very dangerous situation to be. Your first indication so you may have some underbalance is when the sides of your borehole start imploding. You get these sharp objects like this. These are called cavings. That's not a good sign. Or also strange gas readings are low. And you can see with the, what was called the pore pressure is actually gone underneath the mud weights. Okay, and this is what you get in your information book. As an also geologist, this is prognosed pore pressure. Okay, and this is your mud weight. So the mud weight's got to be larger than your pore pressure. 
and it's got to be larger than the collapse gradient. So there's two features that want to close that borehole in a millisecond that you drill it is a pore pressure itself, the enclosed fluid and gas in the rock, and the stress and is on the basically horizontal stress in the borehole itself or whatever. And you can see here, we were getting a bit worried here. There's a lot of stress, pressure, want to close that well, and we just managed to cover it, but we did see some borehole instability there. And you can see basically the mud weights up here for a particular mud weight that's required. And this is what happens. If you've got a mud weight that's good, that's fine. You've got a nice clean borehole. If you have a decrease in mud weight, you start to have implosion, breakout. And then further you can have fluids and gases entering your water, a major kick or collapse. If your mud weight's too heavy, you can go the opposite way. You can actually fracture your borehole. Fine, there we go. You start losing mud to your borehole, the rock. That's not good either. If you lose too much mud, there's something you go into this situation. You've got to stay there. As a well set geologist, you always got to see what this indications of the well bore is behaving itself. This is uh, where we do something called geosteering of people. This is where well site geologists have a lot of fun. Um, oops, sorry, beg your pardon. We can drill horizontally, okay? We can drill up to two kilometers at 90 degrees. And to enable us to do that, we have various, we use our LWD, we have image data to indicate whether we're drilling downwards through the stratigraphy or upwards through the stratigraphy. And sometimes we have a chap who's an expert on microfossils or a palynologist or two people on the planet Earth who are experts on coccolus with the drilling chalk. And they can say, like, they're too high up, they're too low down, etc. Uh, this is when you actually start to enjoy yourself as a well site geologist. Coring is good fun. You drill with a particular type of BHA, it's got a hole in it because you're going to draw and take up a tube of rock. Okay, this is the core. You can see there it's from 4,011 metres. Now the next one of 4,010. Okay, you take this core back to the laboratory. It's sliced up into metre sections. Plugs are taken away to establish velocity of permeability. Sedimentary features are described. And this is what we tend to do in the exploration well. They need a sample of the reservoir itself, okay? And sometimes you come up with really nice surprises. This was one drilled a few years ago, and it's obviously the middle of Jurassic, and you have these paratized ammonites, and you get all sorts of bivalves and all sorts of debris in there, which uh, actually is good fun. And it's always surprising when you get the rock to the surface. You have this image in your head from the rock cuttings as you just drill slightly into the reservoir, you have this picture in your head of what the rock's like, and then you see at the surface, you go, oh, that's what it looks like. Yeah, And it's quite sobering, actually, because you realise the depth of time, length of time, sorry, it's been down there. And it's at the surface, it's in your hands for the first time. Reporting, yes, every morning, 20, up to 24 hours, a lengthy report and your interpretation. Go for it, do your best, etc. Descriptions. You've got your LWD data here. And you can see we entered the reservoir interval, visitivity dropped off. Oh dear, that's not good. Oh dear. Gas is very low. That's not good news at all. And this is what you've got to supply to the client every morning. That's 0700 hours. As a well site geologist, you have to communicate with a whole range of different people in the drilling team, from the drilling supervisor to the data engineer to the directional driller and obviously to the office itself. You speak to the, somebody called an operations geologist and they're running along beside you watching operation as well. It's a very intense field of work and good communication and overall good teamwork is required. The future of the industry. Well, I looked through the internet and I found lots of interesting graphs, but I really want to emphasize some points basically that uh, respect to the UK side, let's start with that. Drilling has really dropped off people. If you look at the exploration wells, this blue color, we had up to 111 exploration wells in 2007. Okay, by 2016, we had just 22. That's a quite a decline in the actual industry, basically. 
development wells or the production wells that you need for that job from platforms, et cetera, you always need. But so you can see the steady decline as well. So it's not exactly, what can you say, an industry that's really keeping up if you compare it to the Norwegian sector anyway. Employment-wise, since 2013 to 2019, you can see a big difference as well. But the offshore mainly is steady, but it's the onshore supply and resources that are really dwindling down. And that has a major impact on areas like Aberdeen, for example. That's in the space of what, six years of drastic reduction in unemployment. Uh, revenue. Well, let's talk big bucks. In 2008, 2009, um, that's uh, UK collected approximately, that's a million, that's 12 billion, just a 12 billion pounds worth of revenue in 2008. And now it's reduced it to 650 million by 2020. Compared to Norway in the same year, 2000, 350 billion, which is about 35 billion pounds. There's a big difference in what's been collected from the UK side, from the Norway side. And you can see here a summary of the graph of production from the UK continental shelf, which has really dwindled down over the years. And the revenue as well, there was a golden time, 1983 and 84, goodness me, and it picked up once again. But that's really related to the oil price. The oil price is something you always keep an eye on in the newspapers. It can get up to $150 a barrel in 2008 and they can drop like a stone, okay? And the last year has been a bit of a disaster actually through this COVID crisis. We actually were in the minus. And that's, as I said before, is a major impact on local communities, especially Aberdeen. Oh, Aberdeen is the oil and gas town. When the industry declines, the town declines. Uh, it's boom and bust. Environmental applications, well, Let's just summarize people. Let's be honest with ourselves. We are living in the hydrocarbon age. Yeah. Uh, from 1859, as the first well was drilled in Pennsylvania, where you can you hear me? Are we okay there? Hello? Yep, absolutely grand. Okay. Yep. Uh, sorry, my, my Bluetooth, somebody's please off. And uh, we have been using this stuff like there's no tomorrow, basically. As one famous geologist said, if we didn't have oil, we'd have to create it. It's a fantastic stuff. It comes in these big polymers of carbon and hydrogen. You can distill it. You can make so many fantastic products from it. It's absolutely energy full, full basically. And uh, we have just been producing this stuff like there's no tomorrow for quite a long period of time. Uh, plastic waste is something frightening from it, actually. As I said before, we rely on oil and gas. We travel by it, we just, where it's a major industry. We accumulate it in vast deposits on beaches, and it is a serious environmental factor. This is a small governor of Los Angeles, for example. This is an everyday occurrence. Uh, as well as that, it's a political side to oil. I mean, let's be honest, uh, any war nowadays, you think, well, what's caused that war? And it usually boils down to natural resources and to a certain extent, oil and gas. We saw that in the particular Gulf War, 1990, And in countries like Nigeria, where it has now endemic corruption and uh, environmental implications as well in various parts of oil and gas exploration. And there's various books being written on it, oil, power and water, black gold and black mail. Yes, just to be honest with you, oil does cause a lot of trouble. It can bring, for example, to a country like Norway, fantastic living standards and no deficit, remove a deficit effectively, or it can create a war. And if anybody doesn't know this graph, they should know it. This is the Keeling curve, the amount of CO2 basically accumulated over X number of years from a observatory in Hawaii. When I was born in 1970, it was just over 330 ppm. It's climbed till I was 18. I could have a beer, fine, to about 350. 
and it's increased to the point where it's just so we're I believe now just under 420 parts per million. That is quite a sobering picture to look at. If anybody wants to argue about climate change, just show me that picture, this graph. To my mind, that says everything really. Uh, the CO2 concentration can be measured against ice cores. We can see over every, every warmer period, we get up to 300 approximately PPM. We're way past 400 now. I think the evidence speaks for itself. Uh, and only a couple of weeks ago, actually, it's quite sad to see the news that Britain had to restart one of its coal burning power stations. Not exactly doing much for the climate itself. How much oil did we use? 2016. We used 25.1 billion barrels worldwide, ladies and gentlemen. That's just under 4 billion cubic meters of oil was used. And that is just mind boggling. 20% of that was the United States alone. It's absolutely phenomenal. It really is, it's, it staggers me. It's, we have a serious addiction to this stuff. What do we use it for? Everything, but only for gasoline and jet fuel. But it's quite amazing, we take that 15, 11% and we use it for everything from toothpaste to plastics, to your flip flops, to your sunglasses, to your CDs, to the casing on your iPhone. Oil is everywhere. I challenge anybody not to just walk around, I mean, just walk around your apartment or your house and you'll find so many products that are derived from oil. And as I said, we need this stuff. From Lego to laptops, to tarmac on your roads, to your paint, to your Tupperware, to nylon socks. As I said, so, many, so, much, so much is made from it and the fuel for your car. Alternatives, solar power, wind power, and geothermal. We have to start moving on. We have to find alternative sources of energy. We have no choice now. And these things are, for example, are gonna be a feature of the landscapes for years to come. Now, there's a new industry starting up. It's called metals. We're starting to obviously move towards different alternative sources of energy. We need the wind machines. We need the turbines in those machines. We need the solar panels. They all require metals, particularly rare earth metals and they're becoming difficult to find. For example, on your iPhone, there's 61 different types of metals, and some of them are really, you know, presodymium. I had to look at a periodic table. <laughs> I didn't know what that was, yeah. Uh, and that's the new industry. That's a new frontier. Production of metals, especially the rare earth metals, is becoming a very contentious issue globally, with the predominant amount of it, material coming from China and environmental applications from that itself. There's no easy solution to our energy problems, ladies and gentlemen. That's the way the world is. And if one picture says a lot, this is a periodic table of elements. These orange and red ones are the metals we need. And they are in serious threat. They're getting very scarce. And some of them are in countries where there's significant wars. Okay, this is a very sobering picture, actually. So the future is metals, where are we gonna get them? Deep sea mining has started. When I was a student, it was an idea. It's a possibility. And now it's reality. Deep sea mining has started and it occurs in the Pacific Ocean. And from the various sources, from sulfide deposits, basically from mid oceanic ridges to nodules on the seabed. Okay, that's, this, is the way, this is the way it's going. These machines are not from any science fiction movie. These machines are actually used nowadays. And you can see the headline there, deep sea mining to turn oceans into new industrial frontier. Yes, we have to find a source of these metals that we need for the batteries, for all these electric infrastructure. It's got to come from somewhere. And this is a summary map of the major metal resources deposits in the oceans today. And this is going to be a difficult thing because a lot of this material is in international waters. So that was very much of a brief run through and summary of drilling, what well site geologist does, how the future looks. Okay. Any questions?